Good evening, community members. Thank you for being here. My name is Brian Conley. Uh, I am not practicing to be a ventriloquist. Uh, my jaw is wired shut right now from a bicycling accident. I wanted to come in and say that I defended my MMA title and you ought to see the other guy, but that's not what happened. The bicycle definitely rubbed one around me it got me like this. So I'm only sharing that with you because uh, we have pinch hitter Steve Hogan, uh, one, a consultant that's going to be present doing 90% of the talking tonight because I'm just good in spurts and not on and on and on, which for any of you that uh, I had interactions with as a principal when I was at Uinta or a principal at Northwest, you probably think I'm good. It'd be better to listen to Steve anyway. Uh, I do want to thank you for being here tonight. My background in Salt Lake City School District was as a principal at a couple of our schools and also as an area director. But more importantly, I was a parent of four Conley boys through Salt Lake City School District in six different schools, including Clayton as one of them. And the old Lincoln, now Liberty, um, Ensign, there were I, uh, schools around the district where my boys went to school. So uh, this resonates with me because uh, sir, the, the grandeur and the scope and comprehensive look we're looking at schools right now is different than when I was a parent, but it does, I do recall talks of consolidation and school closure and boundary changes, things like that over my 20 years in the district as well. So uh, so uh, the position that I'm in right now as boundaries and planning director started for me in February. There was work going on before that with cabinet, which is this uh, our, super, our interim superintendent's group of executive directors with some of the work they started doing as early as July, as things built and as they communicated with board members, uh, there was determined a need with the look that we are doing right now with policy G5 to have someone fill this role. Uh, in another couple months, I'll be able to be doing uh, the talking. Um, when you did come in, Hopefully you grabbed the handout or you saw the posters that talked about timeline. Those are approximations. I do want to say we're, because of my condition, we're two or three weeks behind, but we will catch up. My plan is by August 1st, we should be right back on track. I'm just telling you that because what you read about what happens in March, April, May will probably be March, April, and the first two or three weeks of June. Um, I have met with school community councils, principals, uh, chairs, but also community council members in 21 of our 28 elementary schools. I'll finish the others up over the next couple weeks. And so if you were part of those meetings, some of what you're going to hear tonight, about 75, 80% is similar. I think the real value in you being here is that you're going to be able to hear some questions and comments from others that aren't just from your specific, your school's uh, boundaries. As I look around, I see some familiar place, faces, and we have quite a number of people that represent uh, more than just one or two of our elementary schools in this area. So I think that's a good thing because the more we can build a common understanding about how things move forward, I think uh, is going to really benefit us as a district. We are optimistic about what's going to happen, but we're also realistic. We're talking about um, we're talking about either boundary changes and/or possible school closures that could affect um, you know 9,600 elementary age students in our district in some way, shape, or form. And you can do the math there and say that's a lot of students and even more parents. And so do we think we're going to make 
uh, every decision that everyone loves? No. But we do think that we have an opportunity here to make some decisions. Um, sorry, we don't. Our board has a chance to make decisions. We have a chance to provide some input so our board can make decisions that over the next five to 10 years will serve us well instead of trying to go at it in small chunks or haphazardly. That's our, one of our goals. But again, um, my sincere thanks, Steve, um, Steve, for him stepping in and doing this right now. Uh, it was just a week ago that I was calling him saying, I don't think I'm going to be ready in time. And he said, I'll, I'll moonlight and come do some of this for, uh, for, for you this evening. So uh, again, Steve, my sincere thanks for what you're doing tonight and what you've done at the other community meetings. We've done two. We've got this one and one more next week to go. And I'll just turn the time over to Steve as Questions or comments come up a lot of time. We'll be here afterwards to sit and answer any or all of the, or at least if not answer questions, write down questions so we know what we can pass on to board members. But um, we'll sort of stick around. And if you want a microphone to talk into to ask questions, um, I can come around with a microphone and we can do that as well. So Steve, the time is yours, thanks. Thank you, Brian. Again, my name is Steve Hogan. Thanks for being here, and thanks for only sitting with an arm's distance away in case anyone's not happy. Uh, there's not much to not be happy about, quite honestly. But uh, I will move around. They want me to kind of stay in this area a little bit. If I stop thinking about it, I'll, I'll start walking the aisles, because that's what I typically do. But if I get the high sign from the back to say, get back in the box, then I'll have to come back up here. So. They have me listed as a consultant up here, and I guess that's partly true because I have had almost 10 years experience in boundaries and closures and different things. But uh, quickly, my background is, is in education. I'm an educator. Teacher, uh, 17 years as a building administrator, 10 years in the district office, and, uh, and most of that doing boundary and, and closure issues. So, but uh, I, I knew this would happen eventually. And what I mean is not that you would have an accident, Brian, but when, when I was a teenager, I was 13 or 14, and my mother had a, in a car accident. And some result of that, a couple of years later, she had to have some surgery to correct some things. That surgery, um, she had to have her mouth wired shut for several months. So me and my teenage siblings thought it would be funny for the next three months to just to constantly make fun of the way she had to talk. So it was just like you're having to do. And so. When you called and told me about this, my immediate reaction was it's finally caught up to me and you know, karma is what it is. And so here we are um, trying to help out. So quickly, who's, um, who has students? Don't have to raise your hand, of course, but I'm just curious. So students here at, at Clayton, okay. Other elementaries, maybe feeder elementaries at Clayton. Other schools outside of this feeder, perhaps. Good, okay. Uh, by chance, anyone that doesn't have students at all? Okay, so everyone at least, okay, a little bit maybe. Uh, employees, teachers, staff, fantastic. Because this meeting really is for all stakeholders. No, I forgot one because we usually get a few that show up that just didn't want to think about what to make for dinner tonight or want an excuse not to go to soccer practice. I see a few heads nodding, so a few of those, but that's great, seriously. Glad to have as many as possible here so that after this meeting, hopefully you can go back out to your friends and neighbors and, and be advocates and try to spread the message of, of what is happening and uh, make sure we get accurate information out there. So let's go through, let's just jump in. Um, Salt Lake City's commitment to the patrons, to you guys. I'll go through these quickly, but I'm really gonna go over them in more detail as I talk. You can see if these make sense. So, oh, by the way, do we have anyone that needs translation services? Because we do have in the back, I believe, correct? If that's needed, raise your hand. Oh, there we go, okay, in the corner. Strive for quality district programs and opportunities that all students can access and enjoy. If I were gonna put everything in a nutshell, it really, in my mind, uh, these are my words, not the district, but in my experience, these are about educational outcomes and opportunities. In the end, that's what we're talking. 
provide ongoing teacher educator learning so classrooms can reflect best teaching practices. We'll spend a couple slides on that. Fiduciary responsibility. Everybody always says this is about money, right? This is about budgets and money. Eh, sometimes, yeah, but um, how much of that is about the money? We'll look at it. And paying attention to sustainability and environmental responsibility. Buildings and some other things that, that do come into play. Big picture, 10 year snapshot from about 25,000 students in 2012, 10 years later, the district is down 4,500, approximately 4,500 students. Does anyone remember the state? If you were in the state in the 80s and 90s, especially, um, we were bur bursting at the seams on a lot of our schools. We had year round schools, there were non traditional schedules morning sessions, afternoon sessions, uh, portable classrooms really became a thing and we were just trying to find places to put all the students. That's the uh, that's where we were as a state. Now it's different. Now do we still have areas of growth in the state? Of course. And some are growing, of course, more than others. Utah County, uh, Washington County, uh, different areas. There are pockets of growth really everywhere. In this area, along the Wasatch Front, the east bench of the Wasatch Front, from northern Davis County to middle of Utah County, it's older, it's more mature. We're in a different place now. Salt Lake City School District in particular, and some of the Salt Lake Valley districts in particular, are seeing this challenge. But again, big picture. So we know that schools used to be too big in a lot of uh, ways and areas, but We'll talk in a minute about how they can also be too small. Again, just another, I don't think my, no, I don't see my, no. K6 from 13,000 down to um, actually, I think 9,600 K6 students as of this past October. That's a pretty significant drop in the boundary area for the district. Okay, Davis demographics. Davis Demographics did the study. Great point though, I'm glad you noticed that. Davis Demographics is just that, they're a K-12 demographic company. Um, a lot of districts use demogra professional demographic companies because um, I, I, I've used Davis Demographics or others. Quite frankly, you wanna do that because when I, in my position, I looked at some of the data in my district and felt pretty good about it because I could look this stuff up we have GIS guides in the district, we have other data that we see, and we feel pretty good. But if you're gonna come out and talk about boundary changes and school closures, you want somebody that doesn't care about your feelings to come in and say, either confirm or challenge your data. And if they're gonna challenge it, you want that to be challenged before you come out in front of audiences and, and take things to the public. So that's what Davis Demographics does, and they really focus mostly on the data. But like any good consultant, especially a large company like this, they'll tell you right from the beginning, hey, we don't care about your politics, we don't care about your emotions, here's the data. And I'll show you some of their slides in a minute to, to represent that. So, great catch. In fact, I think, correct me, but I believe Salt Lake City has used Davis and another demographic company even since then, a couple of companies, which is, which is great. We want that. Two things in general are supposed to, and usually do, especially in our states, guide boundary and closure studies. First is state law, state statute, and it's not up there. Now you gotta be careful, if you watch the news recently, you can see that sometimes that's still hard. It's sometimes still hard to follow. State statute is mostly about timelines and deadlines, and you have to do this by the state. You have to meet and talk and communicate with these groups of stakeholders by certain dates. Pretty general, a framework of timelines. Board policy, more specific. So those two things, state statute, board policy. Now, of course, we're not gonna read through this, but I am gonna go over some highlights. Now, I do apologize, I'll tell you that uh, I love the spring, um, but my allergies are really something else. And the allerg strong allergy medication that I have to take dries my mouth out. 
And if my mother saw me set a water bottle on a piano, she would come down here immediately. So I won't set it there. I lost it. Here we go. Let's go through some of these that are important in board policy. Twelve considerations in no particular order, and I'm glad that's in red because this is very important. In no particular order because every study is different. Every community is different. Every school is different. Sometimes these, by the way, you're welcome to take as many pictures as you want to, but these, this will be on the website for everyone to see soon, next few days, next week, so it, it will be posted. It's there. It's there now. So but take pictures as much as you want. Just leave me out. Okay, so all of these things, enrollment data, that tends to come, uh, you know, that's top. That's usually the initial red flag or trigger that, uh, that everyone looks at is enrollment. Is your enrollment too high? Is it too low? Where's enrollment? Facility capacity design. Sometimes we call it the facility condition index or the shape of the building. How old is the building? Not just the age, but the shape of the building um, overall. Not just the curb appeal of the building, but what are the bones like? What needs to be done to the building? It's important. Feeder patterns, mandates. We'll look at one of those almost mandates in just a second. Demographics, community input, that's what we have. Student safety, um, this is a big one. In Salt Lake Valley, in this area in particular, a lot of major busy roads, tracks, uh, just, just a lot of traffic. So sometimes it's more than just looking at a map and, and drawing lines because sometimes boundaries fit or students fit, but you look at it and think, gosh, I'm not sure as a community we like the safety concerns with that decision. Geographic features, special programs, financial implications that we mentioned, student educational opportunities, academic performance. Again, you'll see typically a couple of these rise to the top in the typical study. Every study is different, like I mentioned, but enrollment data is, is one of the top ones. And this simply is just a little bit about each one of those. I won't walk through these since this is posted, but a few words or a sentence about each one of those. I think we only covered those three. No, there's more. So other considerations, of course, <coughs> population by rate, race, ethnicity, diversity in the district. Yeah, those things have to be looked at. Um, you want to look at those things, absolutely. Um, if a district thinks they will get away without considering those things, um, they're mistaken, and, and they should be, because those things absolutely need to be part of the puzzle and part of the decision making. Again, same things we've discussed. Let me touch on this for a second, the financial implications for budget. And most every meeting I've ever had, we, they say, well, gosh, Steve, this is about saving some money, right? Maybe at some point, but that really should be a byproduct of the decision making and not the driver of most of these. Occasionally, that will rise to the top of, of something that needs to be considered absolutely. And, and I think, in fact, that has been in, uh, we'll show you in a second. There we go. The legislative audit that happened, um, that was released a few months ago, 75 pages of uh, invigorating conversation on that legislative audit, but, but really important data, actually. Um, but most school districts, my experience is most school districts don't save enough money just to look at that one issue and say, hey, let's close that school, because gosh, we could combine those two groups and and perhaps save a lot of money. The short-term savings of closing a building is typically not enough, or at least it, it in my mind, would be short-sighted to look at that issue only. Is it an issue? Of course it should be. Districts have obligations to everyone, all patrons, taxpayers, and that's honestly one of the reasons I asked earlier if we had other people that, that were not, did not have students, because um, everybody should be heard, and if, if, if they no longer or even never have had a student in the district, well, they, they want to know how their funds are being spent also. 
the audit. Just raise your hand. I'm not going to go into this far, but raise your hand if you're even familiar with this legislative audit. Okay, a few of you. And I'm no expert, but um, the state legislative audit that came out a couple of months ago, one of the highlights of that you can see in it, this says, the Salt Lake City Board of Education should evaluate possible elementary schools for permanent closure. I'll let you look at that audit and determine and understand why that is, or even perhaps let school or district leadership or board respond to that. But in essence, they look at a lot of factors. Um, it's not just the number of buildings and the number of students, but that's one of those things. But, but there are and there is an economy of scale at play in schools in most general public schools that, that has an impact. So let's start looking at some of that economy of scale. Finding the right size for each grade in each elementary offers solutions. This is something that, that I notice as a principal. Now, I, I taught in a K-8 school, administrator and mostly secondary schools though, junior high and high school. At the junior high, I was in, we were getting what we consider small for junior high school in the 500s. And I started to notice pretty quickly some challenges that that presented when you get too small. So before I get too far down this, again, too large, too small, we're trying to find the sweet spot. What is too small? In this sense, we're talking about an elementary of a school or an elementary school with a minimum of three teachers per grade level. And closer to four is a little more ideal, but you of course have to consider a lot of other things. The building, especially the capacity, size of the building, if you can get to that point. Some schools that works great, even five, and some schools the buildings are big enough that works really well. But uh, anything below three starts to affect best practices in a school. Talk to any building administrator, especially in the elementary. Now, let me back up for just a second and say, am I suggesting that just because your child did or is in one of these small schools with less than three teachers per grade level, that that's the worst thing in the world? Maybe not, maybe not for you. Um, we know the two most important things about child's education, combination of what's happening at home and the support they have at home, and the teacher. Both of those can overcome a lot of things. We have plenty of students that do amazingly well in smaller environments. There are, you know, the thing I hear a lot though is the confusion between a small school and small classrooms. That is not what we're talking about, not classroom size. Remember, classrooms size are based on a ratio. The more students you have, the more teachers you have so that overall, on average, the same number of students in those classrooms. Small schools, still, you have this, you know, the ratio of teachers. However, when you start to get below that three teachers per grade level, it gets more complicated. Um, you're, especially when you have two, you're typically gonna, typically, typically gonna see a larger room and a smaller room. Human nature says that they start to pick favorites. You get a veteran teacher, a superstar teacher. Sometimes you'll get a brand new rookie teacher that's going to be amazing, but it's brand new. A teacher gets sick. They have to go out on long term. You get a long term sub. There are 80 other reasons. But collaboration starts to suffer. A lot of things. I'm going over and I'm skipping ahead a little bit. So adequate choice. Sometimes teacher personalities and student personalities and parent personalities just don't quite match when you need some options there and having that minimum of three helps a lot. Collaboration, when you have pro, uh, collaboration among teachers, we know that's best practice. Now, a lot of these things do apply uh, to the junior high also, less so in the high school, but those are different issues. Talk about those a different day. Special programs such as dual language immersion. Any DLI parents? Is this a DLI school? Okay, so the DLI, what happens, especially in an elementary school with DLI or some other programs, but I'm familiar with DLI enough to know, is if you have 
What's typical is what you want is two DLI classes per grade level in most elementaries. Well, even if you have three teachers in the elementary in one of those, you don't have any options. You have two DLI teachers per grade and one traditional teacher in that grade. So if you're in second grade, that's your teacher. If you're in third grade, that's your teacher. If you're lucky enough to have four teachers per grade level, you still have some of that, those same issues. So I could spend 20 minutes just on this issue, but special programs can often suffer with, um, with smaller schools. Space available for other special programs. Again, without portable classrooms, portable classrooms can be great learning environments, but they're, they're not first choice, they're not ideal. Split classes. Again, that's what, just what it sounds like. You have first and second in the same room, second, and third, and third and fourth, and so on. We have amazing teachers across this across the state, but that's often again that's not ideal, not best practice. A better balance between district standard programs and unique neighborhood programs. Every community is different. Every neighborhood is different. Bottom line is there is an economy of scale that exists. Trying to find that sweet spot. And we see more and more that tells us that's the approximate sweet spot. That means some of the same stuff. But you're going to see in a second what that means as far as student enrollment is trying to get somewhere in that five to 550 students. Give or take. A lot of this depends on building and building size, capacity of that building. We understand that. Some buildings are not even capable of holding that much. But that's part of the part of the solution, if you will. There's two pots. Think of it this way as simply two ways to spend the money in a school. Again, especially in an elementary school. Secondary schools, high schools in particular, have larger pots of money. They have other programs or ways to spend their monies to fill gaps in a school. Elementaries typically don't have those, but they do have. You have the money you get from the state, which is allocated on a per pupil basis. Um, so that's for your teachers. So many teachers, uh, whether that's around 27 or 28-ish average FTE or students per teacher, uh, that's what you're allocated from the state is money for teachers based on per pupil, how many uh, students in the school. The other part of that though, at the top, Lack of funds, schools are funded on a per pupil formula for strategic staffing needs and program supports. Support programs, funding should be sufficient to make a meaningful difference. TSSA funds, trust land funds, Title I funds, uh, ESSER funds, any soft monies, anything other than that pot of money, which is for student teacher ratios. That doesn't sound like much, but it can make a huge difference. Again, I encourage you to go out and talk to your administrators. For instance, oftentimes that's how you fund other things or fill the gaps. Behavioral health assistance, special ed aids, playground help, cafeteria help. Um, gosh, taking a, a teacher from half time to full time or an important program that's busting at the seams but you just don't have money for it. There are all kinds of ways, about 25 other positions or ways to help fill those gaps to make those schools much more effective we know and that comes from that economy of scale fewer students you have less of that money you receive more students more of that money it makes a huge difference i talk to principals all the time that say gosh if they move me don't move me to that small school because it's so hard there are other issues though harder to maintain anybody in here serve on a community council a PTA, other school organizations. Now, don't raise your hand on this part, but if you're at a small school, what I've heard over and over and over is, you know, I'd love to serve and I'd love to help, but you know what? I'm doing community council, I'm doing PTA, I'm doing fundraiser, I'm doing this and this and this. Why? Because there are only so many parents to do those things. In smaller schools, I see a lot of burnout. Staff, even with parents. I've even seen uh, staff and parents choose to move because it's hard. It's hard to maintain all of those things. It's human nature. So that, that's, we know those things, your volunteer efforts. Efficient use of support educators is compromised. Again, sometimes we do look, we look at the hard data, and that is, okay, if I do have two schools that are very small, 250, 300-ish, 
and they're close to each other, and we think we could combine those, all these other things being equal, then and we could do it with one administrator, one principal secretary, one head custodian, some of those things you have one of. Of course, a wise business administrator should look at that and consider it. Not the reason, but absolutely a reason. And okay, this one doesn't get enough play, but I've seen this a lot. One ineffective classroom can greatly impact grade level or school data. I'll start to go faster, but I'm spending time on these couple of slides because they are critical to understanding why what we're talking about is so important. When you move into an area, especially from out of state, what you typically do is get online, you start looking at schools. How do you understand what a school is like? Well, you might get online and talk to people, but most people don't do that. They don't know people but to an area they're moving to. They start looking at some sort of school grades, school data, but especially grades. They'll go to some state website and it'll tell them, give them these grades that drive me nuts, quite frankly, but that's what they are. Grades, school grades, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, whatever they are, can be affected. If you have 10 teachers, an example, but I've seen this, with 10 teachers in a small school, one teacher is struggling, that's 10% of your data. And again, when I say struggling, it could be for all kinds of reasons. We just have some teachers that just struggle. It could be health issues. It, it could be the, it, it's not a skill or a will issue, but a skill issue. And one day they're going to be great. 18 other reasons. But there's, if one teacher struggles, I've seen, and, and that becomes a spiral. That teacher struggles. If you get two or three teachers that struggle, watch out. It's very, very difficult to get out of that cycle once you're in it. Don't like it, but it's a reality. Okay, and again, fiscally responsible with the use of building itself and district resources. If you want to, your business administrator or someone in to talk about more of the details of this, but I've already touched on it. Um, these are some of the realities. One of the things that the legislative audit brought up, by the way, um, I'm not qualified to go into the details of this, but I, I do understand it enough to say um, your bond rating district's bond rate can be affected. If the dist a district has a bond out and it's for hundreds of millions of dollars, that's, that's typical. 100 million, two, three, 400 million or more these days. Uh, and your bond rating is affected because the way they view, uh, view bond ratings is a, what they consider a good use of resources. So in other words, if they think you have too many buildings, too many resources based on the number of students you have, those things affect your bond ratings. That's interest. That's millions and millions of dollars more that we're paying. That's us. Uh, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the taxpayers that we're paying. So this is not a soapbox on, on that other than it's a reality. Understand that that's, these are all, let me just say for a second, these are all why it's hard for boards to take these things on. And kudos to any board that does. It's no secret in here that, that, I mean, it's one of the things the audit said is, hey, you know, the district hasn't done that in a while. Um, it needs to be consideration, and that's why we're here tonight. But they're hard. They're hard, hard decisions because of all of those big, major, impactful things that happen and affect you guys day to day. The precincts, seven board members. So the, the reason this is up here is just to remind, we hear oftentimes that why don't you do these studies according to precincts, areas, just board precincts, what area a board member covers. Uh, the main reason is if you look at a map, and I'm going to show you this in just a second, well, let's just jump to it. This is uh, the district. You can see the different elementary in red, middle in blue, green, or high school in green. These are the four areas, approximate areas, that the district has decided to uh, geographic areas to break the district up into for study. Those are not, as you can tell, the district precincts. Um, and, and again, that's by design. It just works better. If you're trying to do these by um, feeder patterns, high school networks, whatever, there's no magic formula other than I've seen typically you try to do these if possible kind of by feeder patterns. Because if you change a boundary or close a school, there's a ripple effect. So even though I've said this is not really about closing elementaries, the ripple effect is if you do, 
how does that potentially impact the junior highs and the high schools because of where those students now feed into? So I don't think the district is saying. And Brian, you raise your hand, stop me if I go somewhere. You just say, no, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. But you let me know if I'm off track. I think a really important point on these slides is there's nothing magical about where the black lines are. We as citizens in Salt Lake City, we speak about the Sugar House area. We speak about the Glendale area. We speak about the Rose Park area. The area three there is the avenues in downtown. Those lines could have been drawn two more blocks east, two more blocks west, two more blocks north or south. But it roughly gives us an idea of when we start looking at a common area in our school district, we could start looking at instead of by precinct, which by the way, precincts are determined by total population in the entire city of all people. Precincts are not set up by population of five to 18 year olds. So we only have two schools in precinct one, which is downtown. We have a lot of people there, but there's only, it doesn't make any sense to just look precinct by precinct because some precincts have 10 schools, other precincts have two. So by looking at this, we can get a better idea and we can start to see, do we have, is this an issue of small schools in one area of our district? Is it an issue of a lot of kids concentrated in one area of our city? We can start to have the conversations and that's what Steve can show you on the upcoming slides. Thanks, I was about to speak into our clicker. Let me say that part again, Brian, and it's critical. Understand that these precinct boundaries are adjusted every 10 years coinciding with the census. Census comes out the next year when the data is released, all districts are required to reevaluate the precinct maps to make sure those are balanced out the best way possible. The district sends that to the state, a state committee approves or sends it back to you for reevaluation for board member precincts. Right, we're gonna cover part of that in just a second, but let me repeat that. Do they show us or does the district know how many students that live in that area or don't live in that, reside in that area, attend that school? Keep in mind, because this is important in Utah, we are in an open enrollment state. Like it or not, that's the law, open enrollment, which means you can attend really any school you want to, assuming the main thing is there's capacity or room at that school and you get your own transportation. So there are a lot of reasons that happen, but let's go, let's look at some of that. If I don't answer that question adequately, let's come back to it, okay? Let me say this before I let you look at that. Let me give you a huge preface on what I'm about to show you in the next five or six, seven slides. All these next slides do is break each area down, show you the number of schools in those areas and the number of students. Now, again, this comes back to Davis demographics. Davis is concerned about data. They don't, again, get into the nuances and all those other things. At least that's all they were asked to do. So all they're giving us is a math problem. You'll see the number of schools with the names and the number of students, some that reside, some that attend. This is not a suggestion. This is not subliminal. This is not anything other than showing you what that looks like if you're just considering enrollment, okay? Just enrollment. So, but it is important to understand what that looks like and that's that's what we're talking about here. So area one, how many schools elementary are in that area? Seven, those are the seven. Total number of K-6 students enrolled in that area, 2,300. Students residing in that area, 2,400. So they lose a few that leave that area to go to other schools for all kinds of reasons. Students go to other schools because it may be on the way to a parent's work. That's where a friend goes. 
they played uh, uh, competition ball with somebody and got to know them really well, and now they want to go to the same school. A special program, uh, a lot of reasons. Just Salt Lake City Schools, correct? Right? That's what I would assume, yes, just, just your schools. We, we can talk about charter schools in a minute and probably will, but yes. Um, so again, their math problem says if you have seven schools, and again, they're basing this on an average enrollment, if, if you're trying to reach that approximate five to 550, the math simply says, hey, you only need 4.18 or 4.41 schools. I love how data driven they are. They, they don't even round up or down. They just tell you exactly. That's what you need. So that's all it is, is a math problem, okay? Area two, now again, the, the asterisk, K-5 school feeding to Glendale Middle, the only area with K-5 schools. Keeping that in mind. Enrolled, 1,500, residing, 14. So again, they bring in a few more than live in the area. The other part of area two, now this is considering the K-6 option. If the district decided to make that change, what most people call a reconfiguration change, reconfiguring from K-5 or K-6 or 6A, 7A, whatever the configuration is, okay? You can see those numbers and how they change. Area three, seven schools, the schools listed. Enrolled, 22, this is almost a wash, residing, 2277. Sure, just this one? Okay. I'll go over these, and after I, by the way, I will go over some of these kind of fast, and after I'm done and I'm answering questions, I can go back to these as much as possible, and this is on the website. So is there... Was there a specific question on, on any sliders? Okay. Okay. And one more thing, we typically will say we start at 5.30, end around 7, maybe 7.30 officially. If after everyone wants to leave, I'm going to stay right over here. My back will hurt by that time. I'm going to sit in that stool. If you want to come up and we want to talk, we'll stay here until the custodians kick us out. So um, completely up to you. So again, area two, area three, you can see the list. You can see the, the basic area. Area four. Real, real quick on area four. Um, keep in mind that three of those schools have magnet programs. Emerson, Hawthorne, and Whittier all have magnet ELP programs. Emerson also has what's called a hub for a special education. So when you look at the number enrolled in that area versus the number residing, obviously there's more enrolled because those magnet programs draw kids to them. I won't get on too much of a soapbox here. Everything he just said plus. So programs draw students. How many students uh, are enrolled versus how many reside in that area? There are all kinds of reasons for that. Sometimes it's a coach a magnetic personality in a classroom, a drama program, you name it, you could go on and on, but there are reasons uh, that, that schools oftentimes draw students or families. And, uh, but with open enrollment, we oftentimes see this happening, okay? Because of that, because of uh, looking at all of that data, because of what Davis Demographics has said, um, and many other reasons, the board recently said, study all elementary schools in area one, two, three, and four, specifically, for potential boundary change, including possible closures. So um, part of the, what we looked at with this, and, and uh, what, what this really revealed is, um, just for kind of a frame of reference, we have either five or six elementary schools with 275 kids or fewer. Can't remember if it's five or six, depending on when you check enrollment. But what we saw is those 
five or six really tiny schools, they're not all concentrated in just area two. They're not all concentrated just in area four. There's a little bit of what we see as um, possible, possible options or recommendations for all four of the areas, instead of just saying, we're only going to look at the avenues in downtown. That's the only area we want to deal with. No, we have other areas that options and recommendations can come from that could help us get um, schools more balanced. At the bottom, I don't want to skip that because it is important. We're, again, we're not talking about closures or boundary changes for this coming school year, for fall of 24. We're talking fall of 25, which is typical. This is what most districts do is if you make a change. So did I say that 25? My apologies, fall of 24. Fall of 24, fall of 24. Did we get that on camera? Fall of 24, okay. Quickly, the timeline, what does this look like? Remember when I said at the beginning that these, these things should be guided by one state statute and board policy? Well, uh, board policy is oftentimes guided by that statute, but here it is. You can see back in at the top, July, July 2022, is the next slide, I can't remember. No. So starting last July, through about the end of the calendar year, that's the time when you're collecting information, you're vetting the options committee, as it's called here in this district, a group of people looks at options to even think, should we even study this? Then if they find things they think should be studied, they bring them to the board. Um, and again, speak up, Brian, if I get this wrong for you. Uh, bring them to the board in February. Board approves recommendation to study all elementary schools for potential boundary change and closures. So, so real quick, the July through February time, um, wasn't the options committee were just, well, that's going to be firing up in June? It was those superintendent and cabinet members saying, hey, uh, board, we're thinking of looking at this because of all the factors we talked about before, not just the state legislative audit, not just simply how can we best give access opportunity and get the right outcomes from students. One of the ways is looking at schools. So it was in February that the board approved, yep, let's look at these and move forward. Board approves those to be studied the next few months, March through May, part of what we're doing here tonight is going to communities, going to school community councils, larger community meetings. Again, this is about the process, understanding what the process and timeline is. Then typically uh, May through June or over the summer, early part of the summer, Brian mentioned that you could be off by a few weeks on this, but um, um, the options committee studies, the core options to generate a list of viable uh, potential changes or closures. Long story short, when you get back to the fall, late summer, early fall is when you start hearing specifics, correct? Specifics of the study, areas, schools, boundaries, things like that. And then we can you kind of start another round of these meetings where I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot more people at those meetings when you start naming specific areas to talk about, hey, these are the things we're considering. Finally, you get to, I kind of skipped down to the bottom, what I talked about was the top. At the bottom, December, November, December, January, somewhere in those two or three month range is when the board does what's called a, a first reading or an initial approval. They continue to take feedback. Is that thunder or are we okay? Okay. This is a newer building, right? So we're, we're good. Okay. Um, so the district takes that on. That decision could be, and again, correct me, typically around December, but it could be as late as January. <coughs> on average, the board has that flexibility and that leeway to make that decision. Now, Again, that's why it's the, the, the next fall, fall of 24, that then that would be implemented then. And believe me, that, that's, that's a lot of work to be done uh, to prepare for the next school year, depending on how many changes are made. But um, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. Does that make sense on the basic process? Calendar year, for the most part, that really involves a community, not a school year, but a calendar year, 
that the, the district internally is doing things before that to kind of vet and, and, and process some of these options. Almost, almost there. These are the meetings that we've talked about. Definitely rain. Okay, firsthand, the board, the district needs your feedback. They need your feedback. It's great to get these questions answered tonight in person. I can't remember all this. Uh, these guys can't remember everything. Please, please, please go to the website. Follow those directions. Go on, click those links. Give the board the info. They'll see it. The options committee gets these things so that uh, it, they can be questions, they can be comments. We can have all the data in the world, any district. When I say we, Salt Lake City School District can have all the data in the world, but you also need the input. There's no way to make the best decision without understanding the nuances and the things that are important for every community. Even with that, the board has a tough, tough job, tough decisions, because there's been no, in my 10 years of doing this, I've had one study where everyone was uh, uh, excited and, and was, because that involved 10 homes. We had a street that for some reason was just weird for a long time. We changed the boundary, put them where they wanted to be, and everybody was happy. That was great. Since then, your, your studies, I'm coming up, I'm coming, your, your studies are hard. You're trying to make the best decision for the most number of students, taking all of these factors into consideration. And but at the end of the day, there's probably going to be a few people that say, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And so uh, I only tell you this, and this is not part of the speech or the slide, but in my experience, that uh, that's why we need the input. That's why the board members need to hear in a civil way that, uh, you know, what your concerns are. I, I've been, what, I, what I'm hoping to help Brian with is, is, is all the bruises and scars and, and things that I've gone through in the last 10 years, I've learned the hard way. Let's try to avoid some of that, and, and I think we can. Yes, ma'am. What kind of feedback? Is there anything you want to answer on that part? Or no? I think so. Um, the kind of feedback that, that they want are things that, um, you know, don't come out just in the data and the numbers. Um, it's uh, it's uh, some people are going to be even with all this, there are going to be some people in all these presentations that say, you know what, I still like the idea of a school with 250 kids. It's working for mine, it's working for mine, we are going to get that feedback. Others will say, hey, yeah, more kids sounds great, but the kind of feedback they're interested in giving is, once these decisions are made, what kind of steps are going to be taken to do a uh, authentic, inter like uh, how do we bring people together so that new communities with new members can hit, hit the ground running in the fall of 2024? What kind of things are in place? Here are some ideas. Here are some things we want. So um, sometimes those are the kind of things uh, that I think board members want to hear. They also, I, I don't want to. I don't want to limit anything that you might have as one of those. I can tell you, though, that any questions or comments that you send in on that form, they don't go just to your precinct um, board representative. If you live in precinct three, they don't only go there. They go to all seven of them. So I think that's important because the board, we're hoping um, with options and recommendations that are made, we're hoping that the board looks at this bigger than just in a kind of tribal, my area, I'm only gonna take care of it kind of way we want. We're trying to do what's good for the majority of the 9,600 students. We wanna give access and opportunity to all 9,600 students, or if not all 96, as many of those as we can. So um, those are some of the things, sometimes uh, personal stories of, you might have a child right now that hops on a bus and rides 30 minutes one way on their bus because you don't have a 
program in your neighborhood or even within two or three schools in your neighborhood. That might be an issue. I, I've seen some of those come up. So those are the kind of things that um, I think the board members want to hear is, you know, what are possible questions, comments, and also here's some possible ways for us to move the whole district forward as we do this work. Thanks, Brian. I, I just second that. I, I think I would start, and I think generally that's what this is and the board wants, with what I call an everything's on the table approach to begin with. And this first few months where you're getting feedback, everything on the table, and that's more or less what they said. We're studying all of these areas, right? Not just a few, but all areas. And then as quickly as possible, that's what the summer is about, is starting to take some of the more obvious things off the table. Okay. And, and here's an obvious one. I, I'm not speaking again for the district. I'm telling you in my experience what I would consider an obvious one. If you had a school that was just built two years ago, and even perhaps if they had a lower enrollment, would it be wise to close that school? Hmm. That would be tough. Um, but put it on the table. Everything starts on the table. Start taking things off. I don't think you need to limit yourself other than uh, just uh, if you're thinking of bad words, don't use those. But, but that's that's. I know what I'm going to say um, in my comments to the board that I will send to them. First off, I'm a parent of two Bonneville students, very proud of that school. But the, one of the things that I will write to the board is how the parents and the organizations that are made of parents has really put some financial backing to the school, so much so that they put the year ahead, they added to programs, they added to the school programming. I'm really proud of the parent organizations that we have in Bonneville. Since I'm not part of it, I'm just a beneficiary. I use my family, but uh, I know that's the kind of soft of support that comes from a community that says we're willing to stand with our dollars behind our elementary. The arts and sciences fair, we had a showcase. I think it was we had a couple of weeks ago. It was well attended, brought in money, but I'm not parents of the school. It says again, the community is behind the schools, not just because we have great academic professors, but because. That's what I'm going to write to my board. Uh, the rest of the stuff they kind of know the, you know, the common sense stuff that the bond bill is sort of ready and blah, blah, blah. But uh, that's, the, that's, that's the meat of the parent. The two questions I have about the data you presented. The first one is about the Davis demographics. I don't understand. It only says five, uh, 250 roughly students in the next five to six years, if I remember the number, that number is correctly. That's what it said, that the district would... Uh, district. So our enrollment um, over the six or seven years dropped about 3,000 at the elementary level. Yeah. Their projection over the next four or five from 23 to 27 or 28 is as a district, we're still going to drop some, but it's leveling <sighs> off a lot. So, um, the, so that, that does make what we're doing a pretty opportune time to be doing it because we don't think that at least if projections continue to hold the way they have, it's not going to be three years from now coming back and saying, Hey, we dropped another 1200 students. We've got to close more schools. You know, I, I don't think that there could be a prediction out, you know, too awful far, but we've been doing this and now it's starting to, level out and the prediction for elementary age kids is we're only going to lose about and a, you know 250 students over the next four to five years yeah. total in the whole district I mean, that's really the size of half of a school right i mean why close more than one school and i know there's lots of other factors that just well described to us but to me that's a half school mm -hmm. that's a lower half school if, what, you know, if you close more than one school for that well and i think um the challenge is what's happened the previous seven, eight years where we've lost 3,000. We have the same number of schools now. In fact, we actually have two more schools right now because one's a virtual school. One is another school that we, we have more schools now than we did when we had 4,500 more students. We have 39, now we have 41 schools. And um, so we've actually gained a school or two in the time that we've lost 4,500 students district-wide. So it's trying to right some of that ship 
So it's a long possibility long. out there for the board to consider. I see if Virginia is planning to overreact because we're only getting about half the school that this five or six years of planning. It's more of a half half the I get it. It's kind of paper thin data. The second question would be about this kind of data. I don't understand. This is about if you cram every school to the max, is that what that number says? If you put 500 students at every school, this is how many schools you would need? That's a great question. When I look at this, and I'm looking at area four right here with eight elementary schools, if there were six elementary schools in that area, it'd be right around 550 if all the programs that are in those schools stayed in that area. You know, programs don't always have to stay in the exact same school they've always been in. If you look at the number residing, it would say if they were all crammed, there'd be five of them. If there weren't, if all the programs, there'd be six of them. But when you see those numbers, it's like the board, one of the challenges they're going to have is, well, we don't want them at 550. Maybe we only want them at 475. So instead of closing two or three schools in this area, maybe it's just one or two instead of three. So those are the, yeah, these are just the strictly by the numbers. A lot's going to depend on what kind of discretionary space is considered. You know, you want some space for what you're like, you're really Taylor Sorenson Arts Program going strong at a school. You want to have space for that in your school. So if you jam this many kids in your school, that makes it really, really difficult or impossible. If we have a music program that has traveling teachers, we want some spaces for them to be able to work. So this is a kind of a, boy, if you were doing it only by the numbers, which is not the intent, what Steve said at the beginning is these aren't goals. These aren't what the board's mandated to do, anything like that. This is just the numbers of, could it be anywhere from doing nothing, which we are, what we have right now, to all the way to this, or should it be somewhere in between? And by the way, speaking of that, I think board member Brian Jensen did join us tonight. I sit there throwing around board member, board member, thank you very much for joining us. It's a board member Jensen's here tonight. Thank you. I got to thank you too for all the work that you do as the board members and the teachers and who are from our schools that are here tonight on their time to, you know, to understand this. Again, as a parent, I am a beneficiary of your extra work. So I say thank you. Thank you. What else? Do we have, do we have a third mic? Yeah, sorry, I'm up here also writing down some of these comments. So I appreciate it. If you see me with my head down writing, it's because I want to capture also what you're sharing so I can share it with the board as well. Hey, Brian, Julie Henderson. Um, I'm a teacher at Holland. You, Steve, you mentioned something and I, it just needed to clarify. Uh, you were talking about DOI schools. Um, the idea that we like to have three teachers per program, which might be true in a DOI school. Is that the same for like CNA and EOP? Moving EOP into a school that we would have the three teachers together for CNA, or is that an idea that you being considered or not? Great question, Julie. Um, so, I think that a lot of the questions that will also get stirred into what board can work, the, our school board can help us, um, um, and then it's incumbent upon us to communicate well is district programs versus school programs. And district programs like ELP, um, yeah, I can see where uh, what you're talking about with ELP um, falls, because ELP is as it's been described to me, definitely a district program. The, the um, CNA um, and even DLI schools have historically been decided by those communities sometime in the past, so they've been school specific ones. Um, whether or not it stays that way or not, I think is also part of what board members can, that can be part of that 
uh, robust conversations of, I mean, we, we've heard all sorts of things in our visits around. It's like, uh, we've heard parents talk about, if it's a district program, let's just have the, let's just have the, the district put these programs where the, all of our students have access to them. No, if they're not district programs, why, I mean, if a school wants to do it, can they still have that freedom to do that? But how much of an impact should that be of, of district providing to what level of support that should be? We hear it about, should we be K-5 schools? Should we be K-6 schools? Should we be 7-8 middle schools? Should we be 6-7-8 middle schools? About the only discussion around these different configurations and also programs that I haven't heard is I, I haven't heard a whole lot of um, people talking about, and I know we're not talking high school right now, but most people have said 9-12 configuration makes a lot of sense, keep it at 9-12, or they've said nothing at all. Now there's been talk about should we have, where should we have our high schools? But as far as the configuration piece, most of that's been confined to K-8 for programs and grade levels served. Thank you. So, okay. So the next question is the one I'm very concerned about. <laughs> and that is the consideration of moving sixth grade to middle schools, like they did in the Grand School District. You just mentioned that and we did that. I know that the decision hasn't been made, but it, it, um, it has been shown that it's in the slide on area two, I think uh -huh. it is, with the, that it keeps more schools open to move sixth grade to middle school. Yeah. Well, I'm just showing you what your data says. Yeah, right. So I'm wondering, is that something, and I feel like it's being talked about in the middle, in the secondary schools, and the elementary schools haven't heard it yet. And so if that's a strong consideration, I, I think the elementary schools should hear about that. And I think that that's a great question comment uh, as people fill in forms to also ask our school board. It wasn't part of my charge of what I'm doing now. Um, at the same time, I, I've heard it come up. I've done 21 of our 28 elementary schools. Um, I have to go back and look at my notes, but I, it's come up five, six, seven different times. It's more than just here. We've heard talk of should we, should some of those considerations be in board? What's your appetite for looking at this? I don't know because um, I'm trying to get as much as I can from all my schools before we start the board. And I, um, we don't want to decide. I'm trying to keep every anything from being really um, decided until we've heard from the, everyone. The board makes the decisions but I want them to have as much raw data and input as they can before they say, um, here are the decisions that we're gonna make going forward. And for our options committee, I want my options committee to have the information from all 28 schools before we start looking at that. But it's a great, it's a question that's been asked numerous times. Well, it, it makes sense because if you're going to be closing schools and moving boundaries and students around, and you move six, it should be done at the same time. It doesn't make sense to move the boundaries and then move it over. But I'm done. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll make a note of it. And it's a and I appreciate your comment. Great input. And yeah, please email that because again, we won't remember all that. But email that kind of great input uh, to the district and the board. I don't know who's next. Sorry. Okay, come on, I'm taking notes. I'm going to remember most <laughs> of that. But I know. The one thing I will add, and I'm not taking a position, but the one thing I have seen happen is when you do consider reconfigurations in the midst of even considering boundary changes or closures, I hear all the time, well, we don't want to, right now, we don't want to lose sixth grade because does that put us more at risk of being a smaller school and therefore being closed? Remember, the, the issue we're talking about is in the elementary teachers per grade level. You could take out sixth grade from an elementary and still have the same number of teachers per grade level. Now, that's a little different for a secondary school because secondaries are, are typically operating as a whole. Elementaries, if you really look at it, they're operating on a grade level. 
And so that's just one factor I've heard go back and forth and I've seen consistently in these kinds of studies. That's all I'll say about that. So I'm curious if um, your school doesn't close, but the boundaries shift. Like if your kid is now supposed to have a different neighborhood school, will they still have, I know there's open enrollment, but could they be grandfathered in without open enrollment to stay where they are? I do not know about the policies for the district on that. Um, and it's a great question that I just have to write down and say, I, it's one that I've heard before. It's, it's, um, and I think it's a great question is what is, what is uh, open enrollment? What are bound, what are, what's grandfathering in going to look like if it's going to be there at all? Is it, um, hey, if you're already there, you stay there, or is it wipe the slate, slate clean and everybody reapplies? I don't know the answer to that because that's part of student services and uh, and also uh, I think it's a bigger talk with school board and and uh, I think it's a great question that I just don't have an answer for because that's the once the decision's made then what part of it do we have to flesh out again I'll offer an experience big picture input I'm not speaking for the district whatsoever um, I have seen a lot of districts lately that used to, most districts in fact, quite frequent, frequently apply the grandfather. So in other words, hey, if you've been at that school and there's been a boundary change, and especially if you're in like fourth grade and you just want to finish at that school. Um, I've seen schools go, districts go so far as to say, yep, you can stay there. In fact, we'll even provide transportation for two years. That's less and less frequent. Most districts now are saying, um, you, if the school closes, this is your new boundary. However, just like any other student, you can apply for a permit to remain at that school, but when you're on permit, you have to provide your own transportation. I can tell you again that when a boundary change is made and there is still capacity at a school and that option is available, um, almost any boundary change, you're going to have to wait. So remember this when, when the change is made. You're going to have to wait an average of two to three years at a minimum to see what the district said that school is going to be. Hey, after all these changes, this school is going to go from you know 150 to 300, or name the number. It takes a couple of years to cycle through that to get to that projected number because of those choices. Parents, we just sometimes do weird things when a boundary changes. You know, we stay there, or we just go to some other school, we get mad, we go to some other whatever. We just stay home. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen there. So be prepared that um, when a boundary changes, you'll see the full <coughs> efficacy of that projection typically two to three years from the time the decision was made. Does that make sense? Whoever has a microphone, go on with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if we could touch upon what is happening with 9 through 12. It seems that historically that is where the majority of our struggle has been in the district. And it looks like you've got some ideas, but um, I think we're, there's a lot of concern about where we're headed with 9 through 12. I, I'm not sure on 9 through 12. So my, my charge for the next six, eight months has been elementary. Brian, keep your focus on elementary. Take notes, uh, note those questions and comments and concerns, but right now the, what the board has approved me to move forward on with this work is let's figure out elementary right now. And so I will definitely write, I'm writing that comment down and you can share those comments on that page. Um, but is I think- Is there someone it, else that is, is a point person at the district that is, is kind of been uh, handed that? to be the point person? Um, is it just not on the table right now? After this year, um, my role will be, um, if, if I continue on in this position, if this position is continued, I'm anticipating that, but I don't have, I'm not guaranteed that right now. We have a new superintendent coming in. We have this cycle to go through, but after this cycle goes through, to me, it makes sense that we'd start to look at secondary after elementary. Um, 
So I'll see what the appetite with our board is to start looking at secondary. Typically, our districts around us that have been doing what I started doing in February, we have districts around us that have been doing this for 20 years, literally this process and cycle. They look at different areas or different bands. They could do it in different ways by elementary, secondary. They could do it by feeder system. They could do it by areas. And the different districts around us do it differently, but they get on a cycle. So typically about every three to five, three to six years, there's consideration taken up for that area and say, do we need to make adjustments or not? And if we do, then it's taken to the board. But so it's a much more dynamic, continual flow. We're just getting started with this. So some of your questions of what comes next will be, what does our board have the appetite for? And do we want to continue with that? And how convincing can I be that we need to get on that kind of cycle where we're looking at them more frequently? So lastly, there is a graph on this presentation that identifies a new Glendale school in the secondary. So is that just a concept or is there much growth behind that? That did come up in interim superintendent Bates. I don't have it in this because it was not approved by the board to take any action on that. It was, I'm trying to remember, that was a January board meeting. Do you remember what decision of looking forward on that? This is Yandri, our communications director. Sorry, I figured I'd cut in. So there hasn't been a decision on that yet. There is a really strong movement to have a fourth high school in the Glendale neighborhood. And where the board left that is that they need more data. And specifically what was mentioned is a few of the board members suggested that we need to have an official survey of the city to see what the sentiment is in the community. If we were to move forward with something like that, we would definitely need to bond. And right now the board is already weighing when or if or how to bond for a potential West High rebuild and a potential Highland High School rebuild. That's what they've been focused on. This other, this fourth potential high school came up in the middle of that. So now I kind of have to add to that. And whereas with West and Highland, there have been architecture firms hired to do feasibility studies already. That has not happened yet for that fourth potential Glendale High School. So I don't know what that timeline will look like, but they did express a desire to do a lot more of a deep dive into the data. You seem to make that we had data demographics do some data studies for us five years ago. Last year, 2022, five years later, we had a different firm of Biden economics come and revisit that data. It seems that they're staying pretty on track to what Davis predicted. And I anticipate that the board will want to gather data in a more formal way from likely a professional demographer like that as well. Okay, thank you. Feel free to pass that mic around to wherever the hands are up. Thanks, Jason. I know we have some over here too, so we'll try to keep an eye out. But I don't, go ahead. This is just a follow-up question. So if we decide to look at the 9th and 12th, is it possible to have a parallel path timeline? Or is it like we're doing elementary schools first, once that's complete, then we can revisit the secondary elementary or secondary schools? If the school board says, Brian, you got this and you need to get started on this too, I'll definitely take that. You know, we'll all do that. So far, my charge has just been the four, look at areas one, two, three, four for elementary. So could it happen at the same time? That would be a board decision one way or another. Okay, thank you. I'm just curious if in the data, do we know, do they take into consideration the community development sort of path and projection from that perspective for as far as the different cities, where they go, if they're going to have, say, apartment buildings built in certain areas that may affect some of that population data and some of those projections where that might throw off some of the numbers, or do we know if that is considered as well? I'm going to let Yandri talk a little bit toward it. When these, when applied, when the two companies do this demographics 
and the latest one in 20, well, 2022. I wasn't in this position yet, so I'm not sure of that background, but do you have any insight on that? Yeah, all of that is definitely going to be taken into account. And um, would you maybe receive receiving a click back to the slide that had the 12 criteria listed, please? I think one of them covers it, but if not, I know conversations are happening. I can't even tell you. Um, our superintendent incoming, Dr. Grant, hasn't started yet, but there's already a meeting on her calendar with board leadership and city council leadership. And this is definitely one of the things that, that is going to come up because um, we know that schools aren't just a place for your kids to come to be educated, they're community hubs. Um, someone asked a question earlier about what type of feedback the board's looking for. A comment that came up in a meeting earlier this week is a, a person expressed that in his neighborhood, the school is not just where his kids attend, it's the green space for that neighborhood. It's where people uh, play in the evenings and dogs get walked and families gather to, you know, have, to have time outside. Um, Talks about demographics near there on the left. Yeah, okay. Well, I feel like one of these somewhere covered it, uh, but it, but even if it's not formally one of the 12, I know those conversations are happening. The, the board is very aware of the impact that our schools have in the city, so that's definitely taken into account. Can I, can I just add on this one through my experience? I don't know for sure, but my experience with companies like Davis Demographics and others, this is what they do. This is their wheelhouse. They're very pretty dang good. In fact, I don't know if we talked about it, but that one of those showed how accurate their uh, projection was from even uh, from 2017 to show what it would have been this year, and they were off only by a few hundred students. So yes, keep in mind there, there are three three main factors in any, any study. We're seeing the lower birth rate across the country, um, and that's even for Utah. You know, now our birth rate is still a little higher than, than most other states, if not all other states. We've gone down significantly. Next is residential development. What does that look like in your area? Um, I can tell you that as eight to ten years ago, even guys like me in my position, you didn't have to be a professional demographer to be pretty spot on with your student yield. Or how many students are we getting from single family homes, high density places, and so on. We could project that really well. That's getting harder for us because those things are getting more and more complicated. The real estate prices. The economy, all of those factors play into this. Well, these professional demographers, again, that's what they do, and they're pretty dang good at it. So yes, absolutely, it should and has been taken into consideration, and that's where most, most of these projections come from. What they cannot tell, what they cannot project, is things like a new charter school opening up down the street. Okay, I mean, that's, that's a huge one. So birth rate, um, and and not necessarily in this order all the time, but birth rate, residential development, charter private schools, uh, mobility, students coming and going, those are some of the, really the four main things you're looking at. And those have been game changers, birth rate especially. If you look at, it used to be that if I heard that we had a development coming in and there were 800 units in this new development, I was like, great, do the math real quick. I know how many students we're getting. But now it depends on a lot of things. I've had uh, uh, to look at a complex recently that there were four buildings. We had 100 and about 150 students coming out of those four buildings to one school. Largely subsidized housing. Someone bought it, gutted it, changed it, updated it, everything became market rate. More expensive, three, three students now out of that same complex. So if you're driving around and you see all these units going in, that's great, but uh, just be careful about assumptions uh, when you see new units, even homes. That's, those things are just different than they used to be. To answer your question, yes, absolutely, all those things are considered. I think we're over here, then we're gonna come back. Okay, thank you. I am the SCC Chair at Nibley Park. We're the K through eight uh, in Salt Lake. And although this is an elementary school study and potential changes, we are on the list of, of potential closures or changes. Um, we had our SEC meeting today and I wanted to relay some information, the importance to our school being a K through eight and it is incredibly important to the Hispanic families that come. We, have, we know that we have, I think the number was 67 
out of boundary downings coming next year, K through eight into the school um, for next school year. And so having that remain an option, the only K through eight option in the Salt Lake School District, I just want to put out as important to a lot of families. Also the fact that we have an after school program there, it, it helps families that have two working parents and multiple children. So they may be coming from out of our neighborhood, but it is a, an important resource for them. So that would be my first comment. And then secondly, since you brought up charter schools and it's been brought up a couple of times, I hope that the district is taking into consideration of what the draw to a charter school over the school in their neighborhood is and that we are looking at how to be competitive and remain apples to apples with what is being offered elsewhere to keep our school district robust and growing. I would just add, I don't want to steal your thunder, Brian. I just add, great. First of all, thanks for the community council work. That's a lot of work. Um, K through eight, that's where I started my career, not in the state, in the K through eight school, taught six and eighth grade, loved it. It's a unique situation, of course. Uh, but please give that feedback. Have your council or other patrons give that feedback. Those are, again, what I was talking about earlier, the types of unique things, the nuances that maybe some don't consider to make sure they at least hear it. Will everyone agree? I don't know. Got to make sure it's being heard. Charter schools, guys, are a reality for us right now. I, 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 I can't predict the future. I don't have that crystal ball, whether that will change or not, but uh, they absolutely have an impact. Now, I'll give you the positive side, as much as it can drive me crazy, is just kind of what you said, is um, it forces us, competition forces us to up our own game, right? If you're the only game in town, it's sometimes hard to motivate yourself to, to be the best and, and demand excellence. But when you have to do it, that's the silver lining, the upside to that. There are plenty of other sides, I understand, believe me. But if we want to uh, just focus on the positive and what we can control in public ed, and that is, hey, if we're going to be in competition, let's be in competition. And let's do it. Let, let, let's prove the show, the data, whatever else. Maybe it's more than data. Sometimes there are things that are important that can't be accounted for with data. Absolutely true. So, great comment. You kind of addressed this already, but um, my question was just what consideration are you taking into account for charter schools? Um, because my son goes, to, well, I have, I have, my son was at Emerson. Um, he now goes to Clayton. But um, when SLATs, because SLATs take students from fifth and sixth grade, and so going from fourth grade to fifth grade, the classroom size hugely declined, and that's been um, a little bit hard for the kids that are left at this, the public school in fifth and sixth grade because they don't have as many friend options and just really smaller class sizes. And especially with Emerson, um, yeah, there's um, a lot of the special ed kids still go to Emerson, but the um, um, mainstream kids or something, it just we just noticed such a decline in the population there. That's the part of my job that drives me nuts. One of them in my charters is that, is most charters are K-6, maybe K-8. It's trying to predict or project how many of them then are gonna come back at the middle school, especially high school level. Because again, most charters are bare bones. They have classrooms. They don't have athletic teams or some of the other extracurriculars. And so that's when it gets tough to project enrollment for high schools because you're trying to project human behavior and how many, are, how many are going to come back at that ninth grade especially. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I'm not trying to scare you, but I always want to be honest and transparent, is what I'm starting to see is a few applications for high school charters. We, are, we have a few already. There are some around, and there are different levels of those. But if you have more high school charters in the Valley, I'm just talking about in the Salt Lake Valley, that's more of an impact, especially if they are what's considered a comprehensive high school. They have sports teams. And, and or, or a specialty program um, that, that impacts if you, um, I don't want to say this too loud because somebody might hear, but if you have a comprehensive high school and they focus on lacrosse or soccer or one of these specialty programs they know a community wants, those are tough. 
And I'm only joking because I know those are coming. I've talked to people, but it's tough. So we have to be at the top of our game. Hey, thanks, Jeremy, and what's up tonight? Um, my question is looking at numbers and kind of school. Are those like ELP programs and those other specialized programs going to kind of be stuck to those schools as you're evaluating, or are those going to be kind of removed and know that they can move based off of school closures? One of the I forgot I had this. Uh, that's um, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, is there, um, when it's a district like, for example, ELP, uh, could they be at other schools? Yes. Uh, will they be at other schools? Don't know. That's part of the board's, uh, the decisions that the board members will make as well about program locations as well. Can I tack on a question with the ELP? Um, I'm an EL, uh, ELP parent at Emerson, um, and just some feedback from some of the families. Um, it's dual language immersion, and um, a lot of the parents that have opted into dual language immersion are only really there for that. Like if, it, for instance, my own kid, I would, you know, if he hadn't gone into Emerson, he would have just gone to his neighborhood school. Um, we're not really there for the ELP, we're there for the Spanish, and I know it's a that's big for a lot of the other families too. They probably wouldn't have sent their kids to ELP. Um, they want that option. And I know there are some options, you know, Mary W. Jackson has it, and Metal, no, not Metal, like Mountain View has it. Um, but those are pretty far commutes for families who, you know, it's across town for a lot of East Side families. So that's one, you know, my plug yeah. for trying to keep yeah. some so, Spanish on the East Side too. Sure. It ties into a little bit of what we talked about before is what does our community, what do our communities want? How do we have enough of it to do that, but how do we not become oversaturated too? Had a conversation with one parent at another school saying, let's just put, you know, we look at the schools in the Sugar House area and they draw a lot of kids um, more than what uh, actually resides there. Why don't we just put two ELT programs in this area, in that area, in that area. It's because, yeah, we could do that, but the places where most of those kids come from are other schools within our district. So taking, I mean, you can have too many of a good thing too. Every school with a magnet ELP or a magnet DLI might not be the best way to serve students. It's like, okay, we. Uh, a magnet DLI, uh, ELP DLI. Obviously, there are some people that really wanted that. If there were too many of them, you probably couldn't have a program at every school or every other school because there wouldn't be that, it wouldn't be that big of a draw, plus kids testing in with ELP, all those other factors. So, um, yeah, I, I think that what you're saying ties in as we want. We want our board to be aware of, yep, our, some, we need some of those programs to draw students, but we also need to have the right number of those programs as well. Questions of, do we need Chinese DOI somewhere in our district? Do we need French DOI somewhere in our district? I mean, those questions have come up as well. And should those be driven by schools and communities, or should they be uh, district programs of the district that you know that are decided at the district level. Yeah, we're going to have them, and here's where they're going to be. Those kind of questions have come up too. Programs are one of the hardest parts. They really are because if you have to consider moving a program, there's what you think you know is going to happen about that, and sometimes it's what you don't know what you don't know, or the unintended consequences, like like Brian is just suggesting. Sometimes if you move a DLI, or even let's say you add a DLI program, well, those students are coming from somewhere. Now I can come from other district programs. Well, that's great to add it here, but what happens when you lose them over here? What's the impact of that? And, and, and again, that's tough. DLI especially, I can tell you when this started in the state about uh, 16, 17 years ago, they really were viewed and quite frankly advocated for as a way to build a school. So you saw a lot of small to medium sized schools add DLI, um, maybe because they, they thought it was great, which it is a great program, but it was a way to build their enrollment. 
And in some cases that happens, and in some cases it don't. It does not. But uh, in most districts in the state, they are considered community or school-based programs, not district programs. Um, so you have an established program, DLI program at a school, but yet they're struggling and it's not building the school the way you want. And then what do you do? Uh, DLI is just one example, but one that I've, I've had a lot of experience with and has seen it, and it's a challenge. Once you get it there, now if you were king for a day or queen for a day, and you could just wave your magic wand and say, well, we're gonna move that or not have it there anymore, that would be great and easy. But let me ask you this, those school community council members, how many of your school community council members are also a DLI parent or a PTA parent or some of the more active parents in your school building? So which of you that are coming there or attending and being influential are gonna raise your hand and say, you know what, I don't think we need DLI anymore. It's not good for us. You know, probably not happening. Tough, I, I don't have the perfect answer to that. I'm only sharing you again, my experience, what I've seen over the last 16 years in the state with programs like that, uh, because they can be amazing, but they can also be a challenge in a small-ish elementary. As far as you know, it could go both ways. They can look at the school kind of as just a clump, or they could split the school up, because just noticing numbers from online, some of the schools have much lower enrollment from just the surrounding, but then much higher just because of like the ELP program. But if you move the ELP program, that school would just have a very low enrollment, that most likely those students would travel to where you offer the program. Correct, correct. Okay. It either could happen, you know, how that happens, because we haven't done something like this to this magnitude is going to be a lot of, and when I say to this magnitude, whether the school board opts to close none or many schools, just the study of this and saying, what should it look like and be, we just haven't done that collectively as a district yet. Thank you. Uh -huh. Brian since the focus is on elementary schools, how could a K-8 school realistically be impacted since we have only one in our district? Uh, I think, how could one be impacted? Um, I think like any of the, our other schools that are that serve K-6 students, um, some of our schools are K-5, some are K-6, we've got a K-8 school, we've got a K-8 charter school that's, a, that's, a, in, our, that's in our realm. So um, what could happen, I, I, don't, I don't know yet until we start looking at options and recommendations. And I think any one of the 28 schools uh, could close. I think any one of them could have more buses coming to them, have bigger boundaries. Uh, what are the dynamics that shape, for example, just even the boundaries of Nibley Park are so, uh, are so, they're so different than the boundaries that shape maybe a school that's surrounded by a whole lot of other schools, like take Parkview. You go to Parkview and you see Franklin just to the north of it. You see Riley just to the south of it. You see Mountain View just to the southwest of it. You know, there's they're kind of surrounded by other schools. You know, we see um, schools like Nibley or Highland Park Elementary where your half, half of your boundary is another school district. You know, your bound your boundaries there. So um, what could happen? I you know the board as we as we look at boundary options um, and the committee that I chair will be looking at different options. Um, a lot depends on our, what transportation, their input, auxiliary services, their input, teaching and learning. How do we how do we serve students with instructional? You know how do we how do we do the best we can for instructional needs of students? So. A teaching and learning representative is on there. Area directors are on there. Uh, um, our buildings and ground and our transportation people are on there. Um, so different people from different departments. Um, 
equity department serves on there. You know, there's different departments. And so uh, because I haven't been through it before, I don't know the answer, but I think there's gonna be a whole lot of different scenarios or possibilities that come out of that. That could include everything from, hey, we're gonna increase boundaries over there to, hey, we're gonna close school, we're gonna close, you know, or we're gonna recommend to the board that they close that school. And we're not doing it, but you know, recommendations and options that come to us to the board could run that whole gamut, whether it's a K-5 school, K-6 or a K-8. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks so much for being here tonight. And I appreciate your willingness to write down all of this feedback as a preliminary step. And recognizing what you said about how challenging it can be for schools to add special programs. Um, I'm here as an incoming PTO president for Bonneville Elementary, where there I think has been a lot of interest um, in trying to bring back families who left during the pandemic's closures. And I think that a lot of the, um, from what I could tell in the graph, the data drop off for Salt Lake School District decline. A huge piece of that happened when uh, in-person teaching was interrupted for that stretch. And so we're at a school where we've been interested in pursuing special programs that would help draw outer boundary students, um, new families, people who left for charter and private schools. And I wonder if there's a process you could help make more clear to parents about how um, PTOs, PTAs, SCCs advocating for their schools while these decisions are being made could look at special programs, look at ELP designations, because um, I know as a PTO, PTA, as we've explored that, I don't feel like the process has been super clear in how an individual school or committed parents can look at how they can build their school to be more competitive. And especially acknowledging that that's what we're asked to do with an open boundary policy. Um, I think we'd want to be on the front foot. <laughs> to be sure as communities we're doing everything we can as we're waiting to hear how these decisions are coming down. So if there's an offline way or you can put resources up as to how parents and communities can work to attract additional students, I think that could be very helpful. Thank you, I'm making note of that. And uh, I, I'm gonna add again, experience, big picture, little bit here. And this is where it kind of gets difficult because when, when, when areas begin to be named as potential closures and things, the natural tendency, human tendency is to start to close ranks in your camp and in your school community. When next to you, the school community, PTA, PTO, school community council, Facebook groups, all of those start to get a little anxious and it's hard because who doesn't want their school to remain open, right? Yet you have to strike that balance and just remind yourself that we're, we're on the same team in the district. That's hard, that's hard. In fact, I, I've gone so far, what, who this really puts in a difficult spot as a former administrator is administrators. Um, I've told, I don't, I don't know what they're told in this district, but administrators, it's tough because they're approached by these SEC chairs and others and, and your shared governance and, and influencers and say, we need you to advocate for our community and the school. But who's the principal work for? The district. And so, and I even saw this one time where a principal was really advocating for to remain open. Well, that principal, that school was closed. Where did the principal get moved to? The one that remained open. And that was kind of uncomfortable for a while. I'm telling you a little bit, just a reminder about human nature in these. And, and the, I wish I had a perfect answer to those. Um, and it's one reason that a lot of the meetings that, that I've held in the past, where it's okay to visit individual schools, but I would prefer to have multiple schools represented in a large meeting so that you can hear, not just one side, but multiple sides of these issues, like a board member oftentimes has to do. But they're hard. Should you advocate? Absolutely, you 
should have. But that, that, I do the same thing. But, uh, but, but think about how we're doing that in a way that's not, you're building your own self up and not breaking down those that um, they might not have the same outcome. Hard, hard. Um, I'm wondering how the economics of a of the pupils who attend a particular school or the economics of that area um, may impact decisions for closures because you think about you know those um, pupils who have two working parents um, are going to be different from you know some of the east side pupils that you know have um, more financial support or financial options. I wonder if that factors into the decision making at all. I will say, um, thank you for the question. That um, our goal um, in options and recommendations that go to the board, our goal is to provide access, opportunity, try to get, try to offer up solutions that provide good outcomes and I'm not just talking about an end of year test. I'm talking about the social emotional. Um, we know that this is going to some students are going to adjust to this whatever this ends up being fairly quickly and and well other students will struggle more. Um, we see uh, that what comes out of what will come out of our boundary options committee will be that we're trying to, um, through that lens of equity, to be able to say, um, this isn't just about, let's recommend the schools where we're going to get the least amount of pushback. This isn't about, let's recommend the schools that have fewer people show up. It's looking at schools as a whole and saying, how do we bring fair balance? And those are the recommendations and options that come out. Um, the reality of, of how the board handles that will be, you know, will, will be what's I know on display on the public end of all that. Um, we have people that will go back as far as I've had comments that go back as far as South High School, and you know, and I believe that closed in the 80s that have come back to me about feelings of or lack of feelings of fairness or not, you know, those kind of things. So. People have, there are some people that hang on to those things for a long time, and we can each have our own opinion whether that's justified or not. But um, we're trying to keep it as objective, as authentic, as far as recommendations and options, and as apolitical as possible. Um, ultimately, um, our school board members are elected to do this, um, and I'm just really thankful that we have a school board uh, that collectively, I, I don't want to speak toward any one individual because I haven't had the conversations with them. There might be one or two or three or four that are like, heck, I don't even want to be doing this, but who knows? They might all be seven saying, we need to do this and we need to do it now. I'm just a bit glad that collectively that they have the appetite to say, we need to do something because, um, they see value, I think, so far in right-sizing some of our schools. Schools with 175 students have struggles that um, are that don't need to be there. Just like schools, if you had 900 in an elementary school, there'd be struggles there that, that, that aren't necessary. Having schools the right size isn't the only answer, but it's a starting point for us to be able to build some um, quality expectations around uh, just uh, what, you know, that equity and access that we give students. So that's what will come out of those. Um, and we'll see, I, it's really gonna be, it, I'm so looking forward to this fall because I have no idea what we're gonna, end up getting out of this. No schools, a lot of schools, somewhere in between, no idea. I hope that answers some of it. It is for those schools where, whether it's 
you want to call say oh uh, title one schools or if you want to say student you know schools where there's more students where that are uh there are more homeless students or more low ses uh those are factors that we are we're not trying to let uh and i don't believe we will let taint how do we best serve the most students in the most effective way we can knowing that we're gonna like steve said we're gonna there are gonna be some parents that are gonna be like we love this and why didn't we do this 20 years ago and we're gonna have other parents saying you're the son of Satan, and why are you doing that right now? Um, and we're, we've got thousands and thousands of people that are going to have an opinion on this. My experience, two things, has been that board members get it, they understand this concept, and that is that never mistake the number of pieces of input or available resources for a community for votes if you will. So in other words, I've seen communities say, hey, we, we had, I counted them, we had 800 emails go to the board. And this other community only had 40. Why didn't we get what we wanted? You can see we're passionate about this. Well, input is not necessarily a vote, and that's a hard thing, but, but that's, again, part of the difficult job of a board member and district leadership is to balance that out. Um, and I'll just say quickly, you alluded to this a second ago, and how does this affect students? I really lost sleep the first couple of years, literally over this. When, when the decision was made, a boundary change or a school closed, how is it going to affect the students? My experience, I started to sleep a lot better when I figured out that, you know what, mostly for the vast majority of kids, they're very resilient. They adapt to change very well. There are those few students, and, and the parents know who they are. If you have a child that really struggles with some anxiety and some other issues and, and change is very difficult for them, especially some of our um, special needs students, absolutely that should be taken into consideration. But the vast majority of children are very resilient, they adapt well, they're okay. Assuming that the parents, when they're at home, don't always talk about how terrible this is gonna be. And so even if you feel that way, because I've run into the parents 10 years later from decisions made 10 years ago that still come at me saying, that was terrible. Their child is fine. But, but they didn't like it, and I get it, and that's fine. But, but, but if you're gonna feel that way, um, please try to spread that message, is feel that way amongst the adults. Try not to do that in front of the kids, because really the kids are okay. I think you're, if you're about to close, I'm just going to say again, I'll stick around down here, but understand again one more time, my answers, if there's anything specific to uh, this district or the policy, I'll, I'll refer to, to Brian. Um, I can talk generalities and experiences uh, all day long, and I'll, I'll stay down here a little longer. Yeah, my sincere thanks to all of you for taking two hours out of your night to come be here. We appreciate you, and I'm taking four pages of notes and our board will see those notes as well. Thank you. You guys are great. Thanks for coming.